All right, Feel Good Fathers, welcome to the show. Today I'm talking with Lance Hilsinger. He's the author of a handful of really great books. Uh, the first being In Place of the Parents about his the change in his life in uh, child protective services and as a social worker, which I think we'll touch on a little bit today. Building a Better, better Bridge. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today. That's about uh, social policy and the, the state of jobs for men and fathers out there. And then another one, um, uh, remind me here, this is about Amelia. Is it is it about Amelia? Beyond Amelia, lesser known women of yesteryear, yes. Perfect. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, Lance. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So uh, we were talking off air and you were mentioning something I thought was really interesting was uh, um, what is it like in uh, the courts, in child protective services? And I'd love to hear sort of your reaction to that and sort of what, what you saw. Well, let me back up a little bit about that. Is um, I was a child welfare social worker for 34 years, um, the first five in Los Angeles County, the rest in San Luis Obispo County, which is just north of Santa Barbara. For all but one of those years, I had court cases of one type or another. Now, the vast majority of CPS cases are handled outside of the court systems. There are investigations, and the, and the situation is not severe enough to mandate court intervention. That is. That's the you know very dramatic way to respond to a to a to a crisis in a family, and we respect that. Um, so I handled the cases from the initial court hearing, called the detention hearing in California, to the dispositional hearing where the child is declared a dependent of the court, or the case is dismissed for some reason. Okay. Um, I think that over the course of my life, if I could just talk about one aspect of that, is uh, DNA testing for paternity. Um, is now you can just do that with a swab, but I'm old enough to know when it was done through a blood test. <laughs> you can see the number of these tough guys that I encountered who did not want to, uh, didn't like needles. They didn't want to do the paternity testing because they had, <laughs> they didn't have a well, blood draw. They didn't we were, that part. Well, I think if we were to go back in time there, you know, needles have been associated with a lot of different kinds of activities. Um, and especially when I think about LA, I can totally understand, um, uh, that disposition as far as like not wanting to well, get pricked. into a doctor's office or whatever to have a blood drawn and you know but but now it's just a, just a little swab of, of of your cheek it's very easy so a lot more cooperation there as far as paternity testing and just a lot of aside a lot of dads would say i don't really think i'm the father i want a paternity test almost every time that man was indeed the father the woman usually knew the woman, you know, even though the man might have thought, oh, she slept around a lot or she slept with me, so she might have must have slept with others, um, th that uh, usually the woman was was right about who the paternity was. Or I think that, you know, I think that's... Uh, there were cases where people just, the woman just didn't know. She didn't, she didn't know. That was a very small number of cases. Okay. All right. Well, that's good information. Uh, I, I can imagine a lot of trepidation if you're in... Uh, well, let's, let's talk about what, I mean, the, the part that we're not really drawing a line here now is like, well, wh what kind of father, like what kind of families are, are we talking about here? Like, as far as like the disposition and demographic, you know, um, the, the, the vast majority of feel good fathers, you know, were entrepreneurial, typically experts, but in the higher, you know, typically in tech or something like that. And so, um, I would hope that most feel good father listeners are not in, in some sort of uh, child protective services or some sort of social work uh, environment, uh, but just for context, I think we're talking about the overall state of of what you've seen in your experience um, over the past couple of years. So I think just for this interview, you know what what are we looking at, and maybe we'll take it to like social economic status. Um, uh, the vast majority of uh, parents that came in the juvenile court system were were poor enough to qualify for court appointed attorneys. This is just a, a little bit of an aside. In some states, they are not entitled to attorneys. They have to represent themselves. So I think that's awful. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can have your kids taken away in some states and, and not be court, uh, get a court appointed an attorney. Uh, but not in California, not in most how states. How does that, how does that, this, this to me is interesting. How does that, how do we reconcile that? So we've got, you know, we've got these, a significant portion of the population. So the people that are below the poverty line, Right, that's already what a third, a third of the of working Americans. That's almost already 
what eighty million? I don't think million? it's that high, but but go ahead. It's it's pretty it's pretty low. Now when we're talking about people, I mean, to be able to afford a lawyer, that's not cheap. The average the average income in the United States is sixty five grand. You know, even in in those kind of worlds, like I don't know how much a lawyer costs for these things, but I'm sure it's not inexpensive. Well, juvenile court lawyers not not they're not they're not lucrative lawyers. They're not making a lot of ton of money, so uh, they're reasonable as far as that. They're not they're not uh, representing a Fortune five hundred company. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you, you could have income in that if you if you were qualified. But yes, as far as the inequity of it, yes, there there are some places where the reason is is because juvenile court is considered a civil procedure, not a criminal procedure, and mm. so that's why some states can get away with not having the appointed counsel. What would what do you think is the reason for that? Why would those states do that? What, like why why wouldn't they? What is the what is the value and purpose, knowing what we know today about the foster system and all this kind of stuff, like knowing what we know, it's not a great environment. I mean, what's the success rate of a kid leaving their biological parents into the foster care system? You mean once they get into foster care, how often do they return? Yeah. Back back home. It's just a, it's somewhere between a half and two thirds, depending upon what part of the country you're in and services. It, it varies quite a bit. Um, but it's somewhere between half and two thirds. And the vast majority of kids that are placed in foster care are placed with the, uh, with a relative. So oh. people tend to think of foster homes as, as, as what we call their non-related foster care, but they're the kids in foster care all can be placed in with relatives. I am so glad that you've cleared that up. <laughs> I'm sure that some feel good fathers feel good about that too. Okay. So vast majority are with a relative. So there is some sort of familial connection, which is great. Um, keep going. This is, majority, this is not the vast majority, I have to correct myself. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. This is this is interesting. I love this. Well, well, and then since most are placed with relatives, most often it's the maternal side of the family. Um, sure. And most often it's the maternal grandmother or the maternal grandparents. Okay. And so if that sometimes makes it co- problematic for the father, you know, if you're if your daughter's involved with drugs or whatever, you know, you, you it's painful experience, but you might give that person grace or you might. But if it's the boyfriend of your daughter, that's a different issue. You may not be so inclined to give that person grace when they're struggling and want to go out of your way to arrange visits and that kind of thing and uh, let them know about how the child's doing in school and those kinds of things. There's. And so it can be, since most of the relative placements are on the maternal side, um, that kind of can make it more difficult for the fathers to maintain contact. Some fathers, to be honest, they just sabotage themselves. They, they, didn't, they didn't make any effort or made a minimal effort. And so sure. they, we can't say, all oh, it's all the system's fault. Some, some dads did just, uh, like I said, sabotage themselves, seem to be disinterested in their kids. But I think as far as you were saying about the economics, there was some, a handful of cases, a small percentage of cases where the man had a short-term relationship with the woman. Mm. Um, the woman then went on, to, got involved with drugs, and the father, the, the father of the child was a businessman, successful or otherwise had a, you know, stable job and income. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe maintain child, a relationship with the child, maybe was frustrated by the mother. They have seen it both ways. And if he came into court, um, he could, and he hasn't done anything to the child. The court has to take jurisdiction, but can then issue new course custody orders and give Kim custody. Unpack that a little bit using, using uh, street language, just so we can understand it. Cause I, I was like, he comes in, he's a business guy, but there was a, there was an understanding of a, a standard direction. And then what happens if he shows some sort of competency or something? I'm confused. A little well, bit. Well, you, you have to have some event. You have to you have to remove the child from both parents unless the other parent's deceased. That's the only time you'll remove a child, for, uh, generally the only time. Um, but uh, let's say you have that successful. And I've had a few cases like this where the man, very often they were successful entrepreneurial businessmen like you were talking about. Okay. And they had father and child in a short-term relationship. Okay. And then how does he wind up with custody you know, because he hasn't done anything to the child. Why should we take his kid away? Uh, then they, courts can, sometimes a social worker can release the child directly to the father. If it's for some reason, um, 
that doesn't quite work out. Uh, there's some reason maybe, and very often it's distance. If the, if the mother's in San Luis Obispo County and the father's in Sacramento, we're not just going to release them. You know, we need to some assessment before we send them off to a stranger. And what's the relationship for the child? What's his child care arrangements? You know, all the practicalities where the child go to school and that kind of thing. So there's usually some of that that has to happen before the child, uh, child can be released to the father, to what we call the non-offending father. Non-offending father. Okay. Okay. I think, and, and you know, this is, if, I, I think, you know, when we're talking about, um, when we're out there looking at family court, you know, there's a, there's definitely a, this perception of, uh, bias in the courts. And what I'm, what I'm loving about what I'm hearing here is, uh, number one, as a believer in systems in general, where, you know, my, my wife jokes with me all the time about your, um, you're the guy who's like, yeah, the system, the, the, you know, everything can be improved, but, you know, I, I love the, I, I'm a Canadian, so I've, I've become, well, I was born a Canadian. I've become a naturalized citizen. So I'm now a U.S. citizen. And I love the, I love the balance of powers, you know, judicial, legislative, executive branch and stuff like that. Um, but it sounds here in this court, really, it is about the evaluation is what's best for the kid. That, that really seems to be the razor that is being developed here. Right. Okay. Awesome. Um, what else can we, what else can we say here? So there, there was, um, let's suppose, right. Let's, we're going to speak to our entrepreneurial business father, right? What are the things that we should be uh, looking out for? Because we've seen a huge rise in drug addiction. We've seen a huge rise in, um, unemployment, like, uh, the, the unemployment rate of, of males 35 and up is like th between 35 and I think, uh, 55 is the highest it's ever been in, um, I think since we've been recording it, uh, what, what should we be looking out for as far as like internal behaviors to, to kind of address, address these things and kind of get back on, on track? Well, I, I think, let me just go back to a practical thing. That's one of my bugaboos about that is that if a, if a man or a couple divorces and the man's doing a pretty good, has a pretty good job when they divorce, he's got X number of dollars in child support. Times are tough or whatever. He loses that job. That job gets shipped overseas or automated or whatever. The court systems generally assume like, well, you had this good paying job. Go out and find another good paying job. Okay. And, and you were able to support the child at this standard. And the practicality, like you're saying, is sometimes those jobs don't exist anymore. Mm. And the court systems allow you to modify a support order. Um in a, a huge situation, let's just say that the father is uh, disabled in an accident or an auto accident. Well, obviously his income is due. He can come into court and say, okay, judge, I'm not making that hundred grand I used to. I'm, I'm living on disability now. You know, you can go in and modify that order. But I don't think a lot of fathers, because roughly two-thirds of the parents, both men and women, in the family court system, not juvenile court system, are what we call unrepresented litigants. In other words, they don't have a lawyer. That's a fancy way of saying they don't have a lawyer. And for the fathers to go in and say, hey, I want this, I want my child support order because look, I've looked for work, but they're like in this area, like let's say electricians, well, you know, San Luis Obispo is going to support only elect, so many electricians because it depends upon the people building homes, that kind yeah. of thing. And, and you may not be able to find work that you used to have. Um, and uh, it's the process is um, challenging. For someone who is not savvy with the court systems and and i this this one lawyer she talked well why doesn't dad just do that and so i asked her well would you change your own oil and she says no i wouldn't know what to do i would think i would and that's exactly it if i drew i drew that analogy for her because she would not change her own oil she she's not that kind of person at all and that's what the fair is because you might do something wrong and so a lot of things dads get uh, uh, jammed with is that they don't go in and modify the order when they legitimately could have their child support reduced. And then they wind up getting a 10% interest penalty in California. I don't know what it is in other states. And they can wind up getting behind the, uh, the, uh, the power curve very, very quickly. And in California, you can lose your, like I had a case, I had a case where the man didn't pay child support. Okay. He didn't pay. He should have paid. He, he had a decent job as a, as a trucker. Um, and then he lost his, they, they yanked his commercial truck driving license because he hadn't paid child support. Um, I love the you, analogy of, I, I think really the, the important part of this conversation is 
um, number one, most of the jobs that we've been talking about are in what I, I call them the traits. I, I have a, I have a client that I'm working with that, and she's in the huge infrastructure trades in, in a, in a very successful state, a very successful businesswoman. And we talk, we talk about infrastructure workers. And, um, I think when we think about infrastructure workers, like the GDP of home services, electricians, plumbers, garage door people, painters, all mm. that kind of stuff. It's a third of national GDP. People just, we, we just don't really understand. It, it's just so hard to conceptualize these numbers. It, like, it's so huge. There's so much, there's so much revenue being generated in, in these places. It's very difficult, I think, for people to understand and wrap their heads around it. Just how many, so that, and why are we bringing that up? Because it's very likely uh, a, a decent number of people are employed in these trades, uh, especially when we're talking about fathers, right? Um, so that's really interesting. And I, and I completely agree. We just don't know what we don't know. Uh, life is so complicated and it's so difficult to just find good, good, in, not only just information, but good actionable information about how to navigate some of these situations. I mean, for, for Pete's sake, people can't even cancel their Amazon accounts. You know, it's right, like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So this about is the trades. I, I have just, if I could share one personal thing, I had some construction work. I had the, the framing around my, my circuit breaker box. The circuit breakers find the electrical works, but all the framing it being on the house is, is 40 years old. And I needed some stucco work, some painting. The guy charged $75 an hour. Coin. That's pretty good. Wow. I'm in the wrong kind of job. I was a social worker and I don't think I made more than 35 an hour yep, working yep. for the county. Um yeah, okay, you got benefits and everything, but still that's that's pretty good money. And so I think we do, do need to value that those trade skills um mm. that we don't see as much. And I happen to have served on the um school attendance review board, basically the truancy board. What do we do mm. if kids are truant? And roughly two thirds, three quarters of the kids were truant or boys. Sure. And they just weren't drawn into school because I think that th that kind of trade stuff is not there. It's not as it's expensive for schools to operate. And of course, you know, if you have, you know, a, a welding class, a local junior college here was promoting welding for a while. Well, there's very few welding jobs in this county. You know, yes, you may get the, you may get a certificate in welding, but you know, they're hiring welders. You're going to have to go someplace else probably and not stay here. But the value of learning that trade, the very lucrative, um, can be. The, the thing I really loved about, um, at least for me, it was, it was really interesting. So I did middle school when I was in Canada. So I was in a suburb of Toronto, uh, Scarborough, for those of you that love to Google people and figure stuff out. So I, I did middle school in Scarborough and, um, and Pickering. And so I got to see a little bit of what the high schools would look like and even what I was doing in middle school. So I had a shop class where we did uh, plastic work and uh, woodwork. We had welding, metal work, uh, and then we had home economics, which was like sewing and cooking and all that kind of jazz. So basic things. We even had a uh, balancing your checkbook class, which was pretty awesome. Econ 101 mm -hmm. uh, in seventh grade. And then when we were moving on to high school, there was shop, there was the tree, like there was tons of stuff. And I remember, um, I, I really kind of remember this cause I'm a big fan. There's been a lot of, there's been a reduction in, uh, support and subsidy for trade schools, which are typically based on, you get a trade and typically in those worlds, you get a trade, then you apprentice to a master or a journeyman. I'm using the plumber language. Uh, but there's, there's similar categories across most of these trades where you would get your degree, you would find a business, you would go apprentice for a little bit, then you would either go out on your own or some, something else like that. Now, because of the nature of like what's happening with our, the generations and with, um, uh, sort of the retiring boomers and stuff like that is that all those businesses, a lot of those trade businesses are closing. Uh, my father-in-law had a huge trade business and he had no interest in selling it. And, uh, that entire business is gone. He was the only one within like, it was like three States that did exactly what he did. And, um, we're just losing those jobs because it's just very difficult to, to have people come in and want to do them. Um, part of it is employers will say that people don't have the same work ethic that they used to. And there's probably some truth to, and certainly some truth to that. 
Um, and but is are are we valuing that as society as much? I read somewhere that that like uh, farmers that the I don't know the the National Association of Farmers is headed by a woman, and the percentage of of family farms are operated by women is like the uh, high. And uh, down the street for me is the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Union, and every once in a while they'll have a hiring, and there's guys almost always it's guys lined up for by the highway where the where the union all happens to be and there's hundreds applying for just a few jobs and what do those guys do if they don't find that job and maybe mm. some of them don't have a good work ethic or maybe some of them there it's a requirement that you have to have a b in algebra that's like one of the things that you have to do um it's, but what, I, where, I, where does our society have that and you're right the unemployment mm. of, of men and one of the interesting things that go along with that is um Suicide is the third loss in cars of death for men, 30 to 39, but for women, mm -hmm. it's the ninth cause of death. Yep. So we need to do something in our society to have men be more successful. One of the, um, uh, these are the, the heartbreaking statistics. So for men, um, it's four, four, and I hate the word, um, I'll say executed suicides to one, if we're talking men to women. So uh, there's just 4x numbers, not attempts, just 4x numbers, just four dead men for every one uh, dead woman by right. suicide. Um, and then I think off air, we were talking a little bit about uh, the change in the labor force, which is directly related to your social policy book, uh, build, Building Better Bridges. And uh, why don't we talk a little bit about this part? Because it's, it's our connector. Okay. Well, the, the book, uh, my second book, Build a Better Bridge, Social Policy for the uh, 21st century it uses the analogy of a bridge. You know, government okay, people understand. Okay, I got to pay my taxes. If we need a new bridge, are we going to buy a 20 million dollar bridge that's going to last 20 years, or we're going to pay 60 million for a job that's a bridge that's going to last 40 years? You know, we want the we want we want the best for our money. Whatever our political affiliation, we want a good bridge, and that maybe means paying more money up front. So that's where I'm, that's where the analogy comes from. And there is a changing workforce. There's a lot more competition. Uh, for instance, in, in the early 60s, the United States had something like 40% of the world's GDP. Hmm. Now we're about 13%. So that we have more, we don't have the economic leverage that we used to have. Um, and we have more, many more imports. For instance, um, container ships. Container ships are very efficient. There's only about uh, 30 for the, even if they're women, they're still called longshoremen, even if like men in the Air Force are still called airmen. Uh, there's only about 35,000 on the West Coast of longshoremen that bring on those billions and billions of dollars of goods. When in like my father's generation, there were people who had to unload cargo by, not by hand, but by crane and, you know, do things are very laborious. And you, of course, employed more people that way. So you reduce costs, but you also throw in some unemployment. And so, and these are male dominated jobs and that's where these, uh, what, what are we going to do? Uh, we have, we have an issue here and that uh, those it's out of uh, trend now, but what we call used to call head of household jobs, um, you know, are, are few and far between. And this is, this is very related to, uh, I grew up in Detroit. So I, I graduated high school when I was in Detroit. And, um, so my graduating year, I guess I'm dating myself. I graduated in 99 from high school. Uh, that was following, um, it was a couple of years after one of the major, um, not UAW, but the, the big three auto crashes. So I think that was like the first bailout was 96, 97. I think it was when you talk about like GM Ford, um, mm -hmm. Jim Ford, uh, Chrysler, we call it Daimler now. I think it was Chrysler. Uh, Daimler, yeah. Chrysler. And, uh, and I thought it was really interesting because that, that city, there's entire parts of that city that are just old industry. You can just drive through and it's like, oh yeah, here's the, here's the, here's the tens of miles of factories where people just used to work. And, um, that city just never really, it, it's kind of had a little bit of recovery, but like many of these, what we're talking about working class blue collar jobs, they just never came back. Uh, they weren't, they weren't. There, there are just no no more positions for them anymore. And I think one of the big challenges, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to hard skills, right? This is what we're talking about. There's essential skills and there's hard skills. 
right? So essential skills are communication, blah, 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 right? Um, and you may or may not have those things. And there's hard skills, which is a trade, right? Not, you know, everybody understands that like I plug in, a, so I plug something in a socket, I get electricity, but not everybody understands um, how to wire the house and wire the socket so that it right, gets right. it from the breaker box and all the other kind of, I don't know how to do it. That's why I'm, this is a bet, you know, there it is. Uh, <clears throat> so we have those kind of elements and those hard skills, that's what these positions are. And I know a lot of the big criticism is, well, just go get another job. Well, I, this is what I can tell you, you know, unless I'm looking for something super, super basic, if I'm looking at an applicant who's got, I don't know, probably a fresh, at, in a, let's say it's a regular information job. So information worker job, basic accounting, basic computer science, something like that. I'm probably going to go for a younger, fresh out of high school or fresh out of college kid with no experience and a 20 year trade person because a 20 year trade person just doesn't know how to do it. And it's not like, I'm not trying to be anything about it. It's just like, that's just the reality of it. That's just the kind of the reality of, of those skills. One of my professors that told me something and I exactly remember something from college, even though it's that video, is that during the depression, Woolworths would only hire people with uh, college degrees. Even mm. if you were just working the soda fountain, they were, you didn't have a college degree, you weren't going to get a job at Woolworths. Um, and I think that one of the things you're right, if you're if you're having a trade job, you at least want to see that the person graduated high school generally. That would be right. one screen thing. You got you say you have 20 trade jobs you want to hire. You're looking at hundreds and thousands or thousands of applicants. You're going to screen. You can't look at everybody. You're going to screen for high school diploma. Boys fail to graduate high school much more often than girls. Um, I I really wonder sometimes because I'd love to. This is kind of in your in your book and in your expertise. I get really curious sometimes if, if, if training and treating all high school programs is relevant today. So today I think of when you go through school, you get like what, one or two electives. That's it pretty much per year. Like it's not a specialty. Whereas in college, when you go into college you can fully go down a specialty and learn everything you need to, to get some sort of applicable degree in that space. You know, I'm thinking about like your engineering, your maths, your information work, right? Computer science. Like if you're if you're going for a computer science major, it's likely that 75% of the classes that you're taking are related to computer science in some in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm I'm curious about the this this concept of do we have have ha, is this general idea of the high school diploma is X and X is for everybody if we don't need to maybe adjust that for uh, different kinds of people and different kinds of um, specialty? Well, I think that like you have, there's all that uh, left, left, left no child behind stuff. That, that mm -hmm. thing. But, um, to get to your point more directly or the, the way after is that, is that um, what, what do we teach in school? Most of school districts or most states require three or four years of high school English. This is one of my beefs is that most of that is fiction. You are reading mm -hmm. fictional books and writing a book, you know, or maybe writing a story or writing poetry or writing character analysis, a useless skill. Hmm. And boys, uh, this is one of the things I've learned to be an author, I should say back up, is that 80% of fiction books and the fiction market dominates the nonfiction market are bought by women. Mm -hmm. Boys generally, men generally do not go for fiction there's exceptions of course but um and so these fiction classes don't relate to kids one of the things i ask in my book is um when kids act up in class uh and they're sent to the principal's office now schools generally document that they keep that on tabs and so you've got the kids history how many times you know in ninth grade they were sent to the office and i would really like us to look have a scientific study. So what classes were they sent out of? Were they sent out of math? When you're saying, okay, this is this is the answer, something very clear, this is what we're good. Or in English where kids just going like, I don't care about the characters of the great Gatsby. I didn't like it then, I won't like it now. And so maybe we need to teach differently. And maybe mm. we need to have as part of the curriculum one year of, at least one year of nonfiction writing. So you're training kids to be a police officer or a firefighter or a salesperson who needs to write a sales report or a sales presentation or nonfiction writing is what we need to focus on. 
I don't think the idea of changing the requirements so much because employers need to know a high school diploma means X. They need to know that you that you've accomplished something. So having sort of five different types of high school diplomas, no, I wouldn't support that. I do mm -hmm. think it's um, you know what kids accomplish in school and high school diploma from Beverly Hills High can lead to more than say a lot of kids from other school districts. And uh, I won't name a bad school district, but you know that, that that's going to mean diff something different. Even though okay. legally, awesome. legally, it's probably the same. But you, you realize, oh, that kid got uh, their their high school diploma from uh, Beverly is a little high. Okay. Well, what else? What else can we? Um, what are some other potential solutions for? You know, we we were basically talking about reintegration and reeducation in the workforce. Of, well, I think um, one of the things you know, is to it, um, is to have school districts. Um, they, most school districts have websites and they tell you all about the schools and this is the school calendar. This is what you can eat in, in the cafeteria this week. But one of the things that I would require to ask the federal government, since most school districts get federal money at one form or another, to post graduation rates broken down by gender. Hmm. You have to identify the issue first before you get some awareness of it. So I'd say, okay, how, what percentage of our boys graduate? What percentage of our girls graduate? Or you could say which drop out, but you want to say a positive. Let's say, you know, let's go with, because I think that that when you identify, hey, this really is a problem. And one of my big bugaboos about this is a girl who fails to graduate high school, she's more likely to get pregnant um, and require social services of some sort. That's taxpayers' dollars. That's she's mm. an economic drag on on the system. The boy who fails to graduate. Will father a child that he's unable to support, but he's also more likely to get involved with the criminal justice system. His failure to graduate becomes a matter of public safety. Hmm. So, on one, you have a person who's an economic liability in cold economic terms, another person, you have a question of public safety. And so, I think that we really need to do things to increase graduation rates for boys, and that will lead them. But again, you have to, so one of the points I make in, the, in, the, in my book is there has to be a job. If you're on welfare, uh, and typically it's the mom has kids, very few, I've really, I've only had maybe a handful of cases where the dad was on welfare with kids. It was the sure. mom on welfare with kids. And you have to, you either have to be working or in school to get, to get assistance. Well, if you go to school only for a year, which is, the, you can only get a 12 month exemption generally. You're not going to acquire any work skills that are going to lead you to an independent job where you're economically self-sufficient. We've got to change that education requirement and make it two years. So you graduate from a junior college and you have some sort of workable skill that's going to let you be an ind economically independent citizen and you're, you're paying taxes instead of taking tax dollars. So that's, that is, um, uh, that's like your trade schools, that's your like associate's degrees is those two-year degrees. Yeah, yeah, a two-year degree from your community college. Will allow the person to be on welfare long enough to get a degree that will get them out of poverty. Yeah, yeah. So what is the, do you, do you have the hard, do you have the hard data on this at all? Like how much, like the, you said economic drag, like usually we can calculate this amount, like, hey, it's going to cost, this much no, of a lifetime. Have, of I don't have that because you could calculate probably four or five different ways and come up with different figures. But you're just common sense. You're going to say that the child who's in poverty is how many years is, is that child and is that, you know. Right. And when we talk about poverty, is is that um, something like 9% of seniors are poor enough to qualify for food stamps? We tend to think of poverty as uh, those poor families on welfare. But nine percent of seniors are poor enough to qualify for food stamps. Hmm. And well, so, what do we do? Okay, so now we're talking about as a father, we've got a grandparent, right, who's poor. So what? So what can we? What's the solution here? What's a discussion here? Well, you know, and then that's a good point because if you're if you're born into poverty, you may or may not break out of poverty. But if you are a senior in poverty, you will probably die of poverty. Mm. Um, that's yes. <laughs> that's that's unfortunate. Um, one of the things that to but to answer your question directly was that I think that in, 
uh, is that we should require employers to have uh, some sort of a pension plan. There's a thing where in California, if you don't have a lot of a lot of major corporations, they'll have a three percent match or something for your if you're you know um, your four hundred one k yeah your four hundred one k they'll have a three percent match. There's a system in California that if you have more than five people, there's a three percent. The employer's not required to match it, but there's like a three percent off the top to go into a retirement fund. So that if you're poor, you're making a uh, minimum wage or just a little bit more. Yes, some money is set aside into uh, the equivalent of a 401k, and then you'll have a little bit extra money at, when you retire. It won't be a lot, but you'll at least have something that will cushion you through the expenses that way. And that's from, that's California, state of California. It's California. So if the, your employer doesn't offer that, there's a state system by which uh, you can, and it's portable uh, if you go from, if you change jobs, and that's what the poor people do. They change jobs. If you're making minimum wage, one, your, your loyalty to an employer is minimal because you can make minimum yeah. wage somewhere else. Right? Yeah, exactly. So this is a job that can follow. And, and uh, Interesting. But that, that's only for companies that do not offer uh, an IRA plan. There's a state option there. There's, I didn't know about it until I was doing research for my book. Well, I think that makes sense. You know, and even everything you're talking about, like, I don't know of, I know of actually zero, zero minimum wage jobs that offer any sort of benefits like that. The vast majority of people nowadays are 1099, which means um, independent contractors. So no benefits. They don't even have their taxes taken out. They're they're typically just working and um, they get the full amount of that revenue um, into into their paycheck. And if people are maybe, maybe some people go, oh, I don't want a government bureaucracy or whatever. You know that's going to be expensive. Blah blah blah. It runs. It's the cost of the government is minimal. Something like less than five hundred thousand dollars. To, to administer this program, which is uh, well, size think, for California, that's that's peanuts. So, so this is a very cheap program that can that can help and give some people some. And if you're in poor, if you have an increase of a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks a month, that means a lot of money. If you're already making you know eighty thousand a year, an extra hundred dollars is nice, but it's not make or yeah, break. Make you have a real difference yeah. in standard of living. Uh, between that and this this is just if i could just go on about how important like child support is if if a, if a woman has two kids let's say she has kids by a guy who's got a good regular steady job and another by somebody who's like struggled to maintain a job or is not doesn't have a regular job and she's on welfare so for the for the she gets regular child support for the for the father from the father that's got the good steady job for the other father any child support that's collected from him doesn't go to the kids. It goes back to the government to offset the cost of the welfare. People say, well, that's only fair. The government's giving her money. We're going to take some from the dad and you know, kind of offset that. What that does is it doesn't give him any incentive to be part of the mainstream economy. It doesn't give him any credit as a father. And it, right. and it suppresses that child's living set standard. So if he was going to, if he wakes, has a good month or good whatever, and he's uh, employed for three months, say in a harvest season forever or whatever, and that's all his work, and okay, then that money should go to the child, and that extra two hundred bucks or whatever will make a huge difference in in that child's life and the mother's life and that thing. And so that is one of the things where I think that we should change the system. Uh, you talked about systems change. That's where I think that where the government's penny wise and pound foolish there. Because I, I think, tried I to think, find, I tried to find where in like pie charts and state budgets and federal budgets, it shows how much money was collected. And it's such a small amount. It's like less than fishing licenses. Kind of thing. You right, just can't find right. the money. So it's not like the government's going to go broke if they don't collect this money. That's interesting. I think of um, uh, recently during COVID, they had the um, the subsidy checks. I don't know. I don't know if you know what they were called, but everybody got a check or maybe everybody was going to check it. I remember reading stories about people that were like, this is the first time in forever that I've been able to pay my bills and be able to put food on the table and all this kind of stuff. Like I'm, uh, whatever, again, whatever your politic is, I, I think that universal basic income, you know, like if everybody gets something to, I don't even know how it would work or what the economics or mathematics of that kind of stuff is. Um, I mean, it makes a difference for people. You know, especially when you're at the lower they, end. They've like, done some experiments with that. 
Um, and the vast majority of people were responsible with their money. They paid their bills, they paid their water bill, they paid their utilities, you know. Um, but there's that small portion of people who did squandered it. And you could just see how that would be just uh, people would, would eat that up and say, and say oh, look, they, the, you know, look what, look what, uh, look how the money's going for this thing. Um, I, you know, I think it's a tragedy sad, to, sad, you know. I think it's a tragedy to evaluate the efficacy of a system based on its extreme ends, right? So you're going to have people, you're going to have people that are going to, I don't know, take, it saves a universal ba basic income, right? From, uh, um, that was like a thousand bucks a month. You know, some people are going to at one end make, just make investments, make more money for themselves. And then the other end, they're going to buy drugs. Okay. Right. And then for the 95% of people, they get it. They're going to pay their bills and put food on the table. Right. 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 And it's just like, okay, well, why are we, why pun like, this is my, always my thing is like, why punish 95% when 5% of the people are just not responsible? Like, cause there's no program that's going to help. There's, like there's no program that's going to catch everybody. And that's one of, one of the kind of things people talk about, you know, government programs and uh, like drug treatment and everything. I said, well, would you take then, then, oh, you, you know, foster care doesn't work or whatever. Well, you know, not every cancer treatment works either, but do you, do you cancel out those programs? You know, that's interesting. So because we're not perfect, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. But Bill Maher did a, did a comedy routine. It's like, as yes, I know when that uh, you have to have a few holes in the bucket when government's delivering money, but there's just going to be a few holes in the bucket uh, when the government delivers money. And he accepts that, but he was making some exemptions where there's too many holes and, and, yeah. Nobody yeah. wants the holes, but you have to accept that there's going to be some inefficiencies. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Well, Lance, uh, thanks for coming on. This has been really enlightening. I think we've had a, a wide range of discussions. Um, you can find your books on, I think they're kind of everywhere online on Amazon on Barnes and Nobles online. The uh, build a better bridge is on uh, Barnes and Noble and Amazon and other places. Uh, build a better bridge is simply a, on Amazon. It's Got it kind of the way it goes that sort of thing. and then awesome. uh, beyond it beyond amelia also is uh, available i think everywhere too awesome thank you um okay Nancy Helsinger, everybody thank you for having me